managing editor of the Cigar Lounger magazine, and today I'm sitting with Fred. Fred is the owner of Nomad Cigars, part of the House of Emilio. Do I have that right? Yeah. Definitely. We're here at Cigar Mojo in King of Prussia, and uh, we're just going to chat a little bit. We're going to find out a little bit more about Nomad Cigars, what you guys are working on, what you have coming up in the future. And uh, before we turned on the camera, Vince actually had laid out one of our favorite questions, which is, in the history of mankind, if you could sit and have a cigar with anybody, who would that one person be? Mark Twain. All right, you're going to have to give us some backstory. Why Mark yeah, Twain? I, have you read, if you've read like any of his quotes, I mean, he just sounds like a really cool guy to hang out with. I mean, you know, I mean, he smokes cigars, and just every quote I've ever read of his is just funny. I mean, just you know, not, you know, whether it's politicians or, or people or kids, you know. The, I mean, I remember the thing. And I remember literally because I had it when my daughter was a teenager. My, I had a great kid, don't get me wrong. So I just remember the quote when talking about teenagers. But I think he's the one that basically said, you know, when you, when you have a kid, you, you build a box and you cut a hole. And then you put the kid in the box and you use the hole to cut them, you know, to, to hand them food. Yeah. And when they get to be teenagers, seal the hole. So he just had so many of that these things that were just really funny and just... He, he kind of, you know, he's a cigar smoker and, and just seemed to live life and enjoy life. And, yeah, I guess that's probably who I'd pick. That's a good one. Actually, I think that's one that we haven't heard yet, actually, of all, of all the times we've asked that question. Really? You guys have never heard of Mark Twain? Never. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, speaking of funny, you are, and this is not brown nosing, uh, my favorite person to follow on Twitter because oh. I literally laugh out loud at some of the stuff that you post and for those of you that are not familiar that's just with lack of, that's cigars, lack of options if I'm maybe, a favorite Twitter follower <laughs> well <laughs> I mean really in the cigar industry is humor our thing I'm, I'm thinking it's not like donuts that's our thing you know what I mean uh, scotch that's our thing yeah definitely humor maybe a little maybe a little but kidding aside you're actually one of my favorite people to follow you're at Godfather yeah G-O-D-F-A-D-R yeah where did that come from um, well, it actually came from when I rode motorcycles a lot, which I still ride motorcycles, and I rode with a, a group of people, and somehow the nickname of Godfather came out, and it was actually spelled correctly. Um, and what happened was is that when I transitioned to Twitter and I was doing everything, and I was kind of already stuck with it, so, um, but I found the spelling of Godfather spelled out correctly was horribly pretentious. Little. So, so, so I cut it and just made it G-O-D-F-A-D-R, and then just ran with that. All right. I actually I wanted to ask you that question since the day yeah. I started following. Yeah. I was like, I got to know. Well, I wanted I wanted when I first was doing the Twitter thing. I actually wanted Nomad, but some guy in like North Korea or something like that has Nomad, and despite my trying to communicate with them and do the Google Translator to try to get it from them, it just ain't happening. North so, Korea. Yeah. You know, I think if you live in North Korea, he should just by virtue of being in North. And maybe Korea, South get Korea, maybe somewhere else. I don't know. I, I don't remember. Someone told me what it was, so. I'm probably wrong, and now I'm probably just, we're probably at war. I probably right. really screwed that up. I probably, no, the Twitter thing I'm just having fun with because, you know, you know, I, I own a marketing company, and I am still participate a little bit with it, but the whole thing on marketing and stuff like that and, and behind my brand is who I am. I mean, we, we all have great cigars, or I should say we all do, but a lot of us have great cigars. We're all distributed, you know, en Enrique, myself, and the other guys, we're all distributed by House of Emilio. And we all have really good cigars. I'll recommend theirs, I smoke theirs, things like that. So one of the things in marketing is kind of getting behind that thing where the pitch is always like, buy my stick, buy my stick. Here's a picture of me with my cigar. Here's a picture of me with my cigar. Here's a picture of my cigar. And, and that has no value to me as far as learning about the brand and who's behind the brand. So the Twitter thing, 90% of what I tweet and, and, a, and a significant number of my followers may not be cigar smokers because I'll see a quote that's funny, I'll put it on Twitter, I'll see a quote I like but I want to change it so I'll rewrite it and put it something different, um, or I'll just come up with my own. And I'm just having fun with this an outlet. I did stand-up comedy for like eight years when I lived in California and it's just like my outlet. I think my wife looks at me and just like, oh my god, you're an idiot. But I'm just having fun, and it's that's what just, they do. That's part of the job description. It, it, it's it's in the manual. The it's yeah, in the manual because we we would never do anything stupid. Right. So um, so to me, everything from when I started the company and even even now, which is not much longer, you know, two years into it, uh, it's just a matter of you look. This is what I'm doing right. This is what I'm doing wrong, and it's refreshing because I did the corporate thing years ago. It's refreshing to just be yourself, and like. This is how I am. Whether you like it or not, some people like it, some people probably don't like it, but this is this is who I am. And oh yeah, and I happen to make cigars too. 
and and that's that's gone really well for me, and it's fun, it's easy. So for the people that are maybe are not nomad familiar, while Vince and I are often very much against the standard type questions, could you give us you know the the sixty second overview of uh, what sticks you have out there, yeah. or what their, the nature of their origin are, you know, things of that nature. Sure. Yeah, I started. I started Nomad uh, just about two years ago, and I've always had this thing for the last 20 years of trying to take a hobby or interest and turn it into a business. And I've smoked cigars for probably about 13, 14 years now. Okay. And I think I'm just one of the classics of. I'm a cigar aficionado. I love smoking cigars. I have some friends that are cigar makers, and they said, you know, you really need to do your own cigar. And so I thought, well, what am I going to do different? And that was kind of like the Twitter thing and leveraging yeah. social media. Was the first person to put my Twitter account on the outside of the band. So if people are like looking at it, and if you don't know what Twitter is, you're like, I don't know what that is. But guys that do are like, oh, I didn't know he had that. And I'm like, let's see if he answers. And I do. So, um, you know, I, I started with the first cigar, and I started, I was introduced to some people in Dominican Republic, yeah. and that's my classic line, and that's what I started with, and it's a very classic Dominican that's got great reviews, and, and, and construction-wise, I think, holds up against anybody else coming out of DR, and then I, uh, last year, beginning last year, I went into Nicaragua, because a lot of the guys in the cigar industry are like, you got to come to Nicaragua, you got to check out the tobacco, and to me, it's always been, like I said, you know, I, I say what I do right, what I do wrong. It's a check the ego at the door, and these people, I could spend the rest of my life trying to learn about tobacco in just some region and not know near as much as the guys that are there. So you lean on the guys that are there. So I went to Nicaragua, I had all the tobaccos laid out, you roll just that leaf and you smoke it, and you make notes and get the flavor, and then you go, okay, well what does it taste like with this, and you put them together. And so I came up with a lot, 1386 was an LE, which was last year was my first IPCPR. Uh, it sold out. So there's no more of those left. So it was, you know, it was kind of one of those things like, well, I hope it's good. This is my journey into Nicaragua. Then I uh, approached uh, AJ Fernandez because I wanted to do a, a production cigar in Nicaragua. And that's how we came out with the S307, which was the box press Sumatra. And that's done very well. And then I just last week released what's called the Connecticut Fuerte, which was kind of that, and it's funny because I don't, I'm not, again, I, you know, you, you leave the ego at the door, but yeah. I really thought, well, you know, okay, I blended this, I blended this. Connecticut, that's easy, because those are mild, you know, and I'm like, that was the most frustrating experience ever. Because I could see that, actually. It was ridiculous. I mean, literally, like, I, I'm getting angry, I'm, I'm like, you know, I, I shelved it for six months, and then, and then uh, in working with a guy I work with, he says, you know, we could do a different spin on it, so we started playing some other ideas. So the idea was, on the Connecticut Forte, is it's not your father's Connecticut. You know, so it's a Connecticut, and what I'm finding is that I was trying to take a Connecticut and get a little bit more, another layer of strength, so I took actually some Nicaraguan Lajero to put in there yeah. and give it a little bit more strength. And then what came back was, is that the Nicaraguan smokers that said, you know, I don't smoke Connecticut's anymore, We're they're smoking and going, you know what, I like this. Yeah. I can dial back a little bit, or I can have this for breakfast or whatever it is yeah. and give them something else. So that those are all out. And I just put together put together a blend that will come out probably around June, which is I'm not going to name the name yet because I haven't solidified that. But the, but it's basically it's a more aggressive smoke from the standpoint it's a stronger profile. It's stronger than the 307. Has five different fillers to it. It's a Maduro wrapper, a Habano Oscuro wrapper that's gorgeous. And that was a very aggressive one. But now I'm starting having a much better understanding of the blends, how different things interact with each other. But at the end of the day, I'm just having fun. I'm just, I feel like, the, you know, I feel like the kid the Make-A-Wish Foundation that's like allowed to run a cigar company, you know, uh, and just have a good time. And fortunately, the market has really responded to it. Last year, well, you guys have been here a year now. Yep. So last year when you started, I think I was maybe in 30 stores. Uh, I'm in uh, just over 140 now, and we're doing about four to five new stores a week right now. So, wow, um, so it's really taken off. That's really yeah. nice. Yeah. So when you talk about the profile of all the sticks that you just listed, are, are you trying to fill a portfolio? In other words, are you, are you going down the list and checking a box and say, hey, listen, when I envision Nomad Cigars, I really would like to have a Connecticut. I'd like to have a really solid Maduro. Are you, are you uh, going from your own personal preference as to what cigar is next, or are you working from more of a big picture where you're like, you know what, I want to do, I don't know, Corojo. I want to right, do whatever right. that is. I think initially I was, and I think that's a trap. Because, for example, the 307 I went in, and, and this is going to sound really like marketing or esoteric, but the 307 when I went in to blend that, 
it was supposed to be a stronger cigar. And what I learned over the course of several months of blending in Nicaragua is that my job is not to just go, look, I'm making a strong cigar. My job is to, and as a boutique we can do this because we can find smaller batches of unique tobacco yeah. that I can make 100,000 sticks and say, okay, I've got an LE or I can do whatever. And the big guys, it just gets lost in the shuffle. So Absolutely. what I started to change my mindset when I was getting frustrated is I said, you know what, instead of saying I need this profile stick, if I find really good tobacco, then it's my job, what can I blend with it to really showcase that tobacco for what it's supposed to be? That's why the 307 ended up to be probably a seven and a half out of 10 strength as opposed to being stronger because that's what that needed to be. The box press Sumatra, the, the, the Esteli Lajero and everything else, that's just what that ended up being. So n the answer to your question is, um, I think initially I thought that, yeah. but in the very beginning, of course, I'm thinking, man, I'm just happy to have one cigar people are buying. Right. Um, I think that I revisited that when I went back to blend, and I actually came up with two blends I like, and the choice of releasing the one in June is because it's a more full-bodied, more, much more complex cigar. So that was a portfolio choice. Okay. But for the most part, now I'm just playing with lots of different blends, and what do I like? The Connecticut, for example, every Connecticut I was smoking was just like boring, boring, not unique, like everyone else on the shelf. Yeah. And I, so I didn't want to fill a slot just to say, I now have a Connecticut. Right. If I'm gonna put out a cigar, I want it to be my cigar and something I enjoy. And the problem I had initially on the Maduros was, is I don't smoke a ton of Maduros, and so I didn't want to put out a cigar just to fill a portfolio slot. Right. It had to be something that I would smoke. And, and that's, to me, that drives the process now. So when we talk about cigars that you like to smoke prior to House of Emilio, prior to Nomad, what were you smoking, what could we, if we popped open a Herfador, what, I mean, give me three or five cigars that got you really jazzed about, particularly as you were closer to coming into the cigar right, industry. Right. What were those ones late in the game where you were going, yeah, that's really good, or I want to aspire to be right, something right. like that? I would say um, on the Dominican side, I really like a lot of the Avos. Yeah. Um, I really like the classics. I really like some of the other ones. Some of his older ones I really liked. Um, you know, some of the other guys, I, I have a lot of respect for Dion and Illusion. I really, I really think the dude's just got a mad palate. It's incredible. Um, you know, he's like the rest of us. We're all this motley looking crew that we look like she doing moonshine instead of cigars. <laughs> I mean, we're all just this band of weird people. We but can't, we can't relate to that. Right? Yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> we blend in with everybody. Well, yeah, but, but I mean, I really respect what he's done. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of respect for Jonathan Drew. Uh, Sam Lucia, I mean, people that are willing to not say, you know, or not be a fifth generation cigar maker saying, look, we have to make it the way our father made it, whose grandfather made it, and things like that. These are guys that are going in and relatively sa playing with the same tobacco, but you know what? Let's do something different. Yeah. I don't want my father's cigar. I don't want, you know, I want to do something different. So I tend to gravitate towards those people that aren't afraid to play with tobacco. And even if it's a cigar that's not on my profile, I respect if they did it and fully committed to that cigar. Yeah. So those are a couple guys that, that I would say definitely I would gravitate towards, uh, whether I smoke all their cigars or not, depends on who you're talking about, but just guys that really aren't afraid to just go, you know what, I want to do something different, and they, they commit to what it is. It's, it's like watching a movie that has a horrible, horrible, depressing ending, but you still like the movie because you're like, man, they just committed and won all out to the end on it. Yeah. And, 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 and what happens is, is that these guys come up with some stellar cigars in the process, because they weren't trying to blend for everybody, they were blending for something specific they really wanted out of that tobacco. Yeah, and, and piggybacking on Sam, we just had the pleasure uh, two weeks ago of driving out to his uh, man cave, which sits in the back of his house. It's literally a renovated garage, uh, but he's done a really nice job with it. Um, you know, you talk about the culture of, for you both, going into an industry that has a, a a very rich history, right? For a lot of the families that go back, yeah. And and you think about the groups. Uh, Blanco is a name that comes. They're everywhere. I mean, if they right. weren't in one place, they're now in another place, and somebody's a cousin, which is terrific. Actually, it's it's one of the attributes of the community that I I like about it. But you and and Sam come in from the outside. How are you received by that group? That, that, that's an excellent question, and, and I wasn't sure when I walked into it how it would be with either either boutiques or people who have been around forever. I think what I found for myself is, and, and you know, obviously mad respect to those people and, and what they do and what they still do, 
Uh, I think when you go in like I did, and like I said, it's a check ego at the door, and you want to learn. When I thought they would be very close to the vest and go, look, I've got these secrets and I'm not sharing them. They get right. passed down to my son and you know whatever. What I found was is that if you went in with the right mindset and you were respectful and passionate about the art and passionate about tobacco, all the doors open as far as what they're willing to share. If they see that you're sincere and you're passionate about the art of creating a cigar and the blending of a cigar, I found them to be totally open. And I was amazed how many of them, even though they would never necessarily admit it publicly yeah. and may not smoke my cigar, they're still respectful because at some point in their lives or their parents' lives, that was somebody that was doing something that probably wasn't like their parents did or grandparents did. Yeah. So they see that. And, 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 and if you're doing it, like I said, for the right reasons, I think they're very, very open to someone going out and playing. And, and, and it's almost like, you know, I imagine to them like watching a kid play in a play, playground and go, man, have fun. I used to be that. I used to do some of that. Absolutely. And some of them, of course, still do. And I don't, I don't mean anything disrespectful, but yeah. I think if you're true to the art form, uh, I think that they're very, they're very open to that. Oh, that's 